Good day to you, Cynthia and Baptist family. Uh, it's not too often the pastor gets to preach from his office. Uh, so this is a little bit different. We find ourselves in some times that um, our reality has changed a little bit. And I don't know if this is a temporary thing or uh, how long this is going to last. But my plan is for the, for the meantime uh, to do sermons and uh, put them online for you to watch either on Facebook or YouTube. We're going to try to get a link to that. Uh, Paul... Uh, Music minister uh, always, uh, without it, without fail, uh, puts the uh, music ahead of time on Facebook, and we'll try to get a link to that as well. And uh, I would encourage you to uh, listen to the music and worship there in your homes, and then uh, get your Bibles out, and uh, we'll do our uh, do our best to to study Scripture as we continue on through the Book of Acts. And uh, perfect timing, uh, God's timing is always perfect. Just so happens we find ourselves here in Acts chapter 12, and uh, you know if there's ever a time uh, when we as a church need to be praying, it's it's now uh, with the current situation that we find ourselves in in today's uh, reality. Uh, God's people have always prayed, and it's one of the greatest things that we get to do um, as followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, so I want to just pick up, and we're gonna we're gonna be in Acts chapter 12 today, where we left off. Uh, last time, and uh, we're just going to read the first 12 verses uh, today, and and uh, I'll uh, elaborate on them a little bit. Uh, we pick up there in verse 1. Uh, it was about the time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover, and so Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance, and suddenly... An angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrist. And then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. After Peter did so, wrap your cloak around me and follow me. The angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. And then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel to rescue me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. You know, beloved, one of the greatest things that we get to do as believers is pray. Uh, to bow down and lift our eyes to heaven and call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You see, we enter into the throne room of heaven and we get to speak to the God who created every single thing. Beloved. I don't know about you, but that actually excites me. Because things happen when we call on the name of the Lord and we pray. We've seen things even in our midst as we at church have gathered together and pray. We've seen sick people heal. Cancer has just left their lives. We've seen lives restored. We've seen families change and come together. You see, God answers prayers in many number of ways. And it's always to his glory. And sometimes to the miraculous. Throughout the book of Acts, we have been reading about the amazing power that was experienced by the early church as they prayed to God and God moved. And before we walk through the book of Nehemiah, and we saw a man there that was earnest in his prayer for his people and for his city, and the love of God moved. And throughout church history, we can look back and we can see men and women who humbly trusted in God and experienced great power and through personal prayer. We could move forward and look at biographies of men like D.L. Moody, J. 
George Mueller, Charles Spurgeon, Billy Graham, and see that there was fervent prayer, it was habitual practice in these men's lives. Why? Because they knew that our God is a God who answers the prayer of his people. This church here that we see here in the book of Acts, they desire an intervention on God from God with his power and presence in their lives. And I, and I don't know about you, <coughs> but what that's exactly what I want for us. I, I want my heart in the right place to hear from God when he calls to me and, and be able to call out to him much like Daniel did when he was in the lion's den. You, you read this passage and you see there's an absolute sense on Peter's life as he's sitting in a jail cell between two guards and and it all comes from a heart that has been turned to God and knows that God answers prayers and that God is going to always be with him. And that's kind of what we're looking at today here as we talk about prayer. You know, the first thing that I see from this passage is there was a reason to pray. This church had a reason to gather together and pray. If you look at verses 1 through 5, we see a few things that are beginning to unfold here in the passage. You may or may not know this, but there was a new king in charge uh, there in Jerusalem that Luke has introduced us to. This new king is Herod Agrippa I. Um, Herod can kind of get us confused because there's so many of them in the Bible, uh, but this particular one is the grandson of Herod the Great. He is nephew of both Philip and Herod the Tetrarch. He had grown up in Rome uh, after his grandfather, Herod the Great, had his father executed. Uh, and, and he was fearful. Herod, we know, was a fearful man. He had many of his relatives executed. And so he executes his son and sends his grandson, along with his mother, off to Rome. And so this Herod, Herod Agrippa I, was raised by Roman aristocracy with future emperors like Caligula and Claudius, and all those connections that he's had has now moved him into this position of power. And so he has both of his uncles, both Philip and Herod the Tetrarch, deposed, and he assumes this vassal position as king of almost all of the Middle East. He's pretty much as Roman as a Jewish king can get. And so the first order of business for any king like this is to win the favor of of the Jews there in this re in this region, and so uh, what does a Roman do in that case? He eliminates the enemy, and so for the Jews, that is to arrest the followers of Jesus Christ. And so he grabs some Christians, and among them is James, one of the Lord's faithful disciples, and he has him beheaded very quickly. Side note: Legend has it that while James was in prison, he led many of the guards. Uh, to Christ. Uh, Herod's plan is kind of working here as we uh, look in the passage. Uh, he is winning the favor of the Jewish leadership. And so this Jewish sect, the Sanhedrin, they love this. And so he decides, I'm going to arrest Peter as well. And so he has Peter arrested. And uh, Peter is going to probably suffer the same fate as James, if not for intervention from God. And so the passage tells us that this happens during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is right after Passover, kind of coming around our Easter season here pretty soon. And Herod has Peter grabbed with the intention of executing Peter in the same way, just as the time is right. But he needs to hold him for a while. You see, there's just as much political drama then as there is today in our time. And if he can hold Peter for a little longer and stretch this out, he'll be known as the man who killed Peter, the Lord's top apostle. But there's something going on behind the scenes here, church. We, we see that in the passage. The church continues to meet together. Their, their main reason is to pray for Peter. And so read with me verse 5. And so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. That's an interesting verse, beloved. You know, Proverbs 6, 9 says, It's in the heart, uh, heart of a man to plan his course, but the Lord determines him step, his steps. God determines everything. I don't know we're facing some things today, but God's in control, church. We just have to listen to him and follow him. 
there's nothing that's happening right now that surprises God. Nothing that isn't working into his plan. You know, we may see hard times. We, we may not understand why everything is happening the way that it is, but God knows. And, and you know, that we have some things that we can celebrate because ultimately our Redeemer lives. Think about what this church has been through in the last few years. I mean, it was an up and down situation. They, they had some peace. They'd experienced a phenomenal growth. There was so much to be thankful for, but now, now some one of their leaders has been executed and another one is in prison facing death. We've talked to some length in the last several weeks that they have been going through a famine. That was one of the reasons that the church in Antioch had taken up a collection and sent to this church. I imagine if we were faced with the same circumstances here, we might try to muster an army go down and break him out, but that's not the answer that's needed in this passage. And we find one very important word in this verse, verse 5, and it's right in the middle of verse 5, and it's, it's, it's a word that transforms the meaning of a sentence. It negates the first part of what was said, and we usually don't get a whole lot of thought, but it's the word but. But the church was praying. So their reason for meeting together was one of importance. Their beloved friend and pastor is facing death. Their hearts are broken. They're out of options here. And we find that this is not just a casual prayer. Um, th this is a prayer that's made, as the pastor says, without ceasing to God. And we read even after Peter gets out of prison that the church continues to pray. They knew they needed to get God involved. That's the only way for them here. And beloved, today's church has all the more reason to be in fervent prayer. There's still an ever increasing number of personal issues that we're facing. Depression, anxiety, loneliness. Sin is encroaching at our door. The national issues of abortion, homosexuality, sexual immorality, drug and alcohol abuse. There's violence in our communities. Sickness, the amount of evil that's in our culture is growing. And in general, the church as a whole, we, we, we seem that we've kind of walled ourselves in to this spiritual bubble. Beloved, if there is ever a time and a reason to pray, it's now. Perhaps... We're just unaware. Or maybe we've isolated ourselves in an effort to protect our, our sanity. Perhaps death and evil around us is a little more subtle. And kind of like the proverbial frog in a pot. We're just kind of sitting there and it's slowly being turned up around us. And we haven't really realized it. But church, we live in a day where God is being removed from every vestige of our nation and not only that, Christians are being persecuted on a daily basis. I mean, we, we look at our situation here in the United States with this virus that's going around, but we have brothers and sisters that are being beheaded just like James in other parts of the world. They're being kicked out of their homes, starved to death, imprisoned. Businesses are being sued because of individuals that are taking a stand against sin. Churches and religious institutions are being forced to comply with legislation that endorses and even funds immoral acts and promotes the very sin that God hates. And we wonder why a great majority of our churches are either plateauing or in decline. You see, when we look around our churches, we see all these empty seats. And what I'm just calling out for the church to do today is pray. We, we need to be on our knees praying God. We serve the Lord of hosts, beloved. The God who has all resources at his disposal. He has the power to deliver us from evil and from the sickness that's around us. We don't do it in our own strength. We, we call on him. We rely on him. We invite him into the situation and he removes the obstacles out of our way. And I promise you, if we invite God in, God will move. God knows what we need, but he needs to hear from us. You see, God is mighty to save. And the enemy did not succeed in destroying the early church, and it will not defeat her today because God was 
and God is involved in our lives. You see, this church, they had a reason to pray, and they had a reason to call on God. Their reason in this passage is Peter's safety. And so the reason is purposeful, and it's intentful, intentional. And, and this time, the church has one unified goal. They pray, they're praying for Peter's safety and his release. Now, I'm sure they had so many other things that are on their minds and in their lives at this time. But this is not the time for them to gather and go over their little list of needs and wants. Goal number one in this instance right here is Peter's release. And so they're coming together. They're agreeing that there is a brother that needs to be strengthened. He needs to be released. And this is a prayer that is only answerable by God. Church was focused. And if you look ahead to verse 12, we see that once Peter got out, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where some of the church was gathered to pray. And the church was focused on accomplishing the goal of praying to God. And, and see, they needed to do that. And God is going to answer that according to his purpose. And so we still can find them continually in prayer. Beloved, that's why we need to be praying today. We have a reason to pray. One of the other things that we find here in our passage is not only do they have a reason to pray, but they have a responsibility to pray. Doesn't matter if you're eloquent with words. Doesn't have to do with with all these other things. It has to do with the sincerity in your heart. You see, all believers can pray. And as believers, we are called to always intercede for one another. Ephesians 6, 18 says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, which is perfect for the time that we're in today, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. See, beloved, we, we pray. When the Bible speaks of prayer, it carries with it this heightened sense of urgency. You realize every moment of our lives brings a crisis of sorts. We live in a fallen world. There are things around us that can harm us. We see that currently in the news today with this disease. See, Cynthiana has become kind of the focus of our state. I mean, who would have thought months ago or even years ago that this disease would come here? But it has. And let me just remind you, that doesn't change God's plan doesn't affect it one bit. You see, there's always been disease. There's always been war. There's always been famine. Even our own bodies are breaking down. I've made the comment a numerous times that I'm losing a little bit here on top. Everything is in this process. But you guess, guess what, church? God is holding it all together. We know that. We trust in that. And as time goes on, most of us immune ourselves to the panic that would ensue if we focused on all of those issues all of the time. That's why we're seeing a rise in anxiety and fear today because there are folks that cannot help but focus on those issues and all the other problems that are going on today. Now, it, it's okay to be prudent, to take steps in dealing with real issues. That's what we're doing here at the church right now as we are doing this online. But, beloved, our main trust is in the Lord. We can't live in constant fear or isolate ourselves away from the rest of the world. We trust in God. And here in our passage, their brother in Christ was in trouble. That's the crisis right now. Their responsibility is to call out to God on behalf of their brother in Christ. I don't know that we look at things as their crisis anymore unless they get to the point where it seems like it's out of our control, like we're going through right now. But I know here for a fact that this church, they're dealing with all sorts of things, just like we are dealing with all sorts of things. If it wasn't the coronavirus right now, there's financial issues that are going on in our church. There's emotional problems that are going on in our church. There's spiritual unrest in our communities. There's people in our midst that have families that are sick. They're hurting you know, with this virus that's going around, uh, you know, there's so many things that are going on. And yes, there all these problems are real. And yeah, we need to be responsive to those things. But that's not our biggest threat. 
our biggest threat, in my view, is the great majority of our community around us that's lost. Do you know that that directly affects you? Lost people tend to act like lost people. Now, we've got some semblance of order still in place with our slowly disintegrating Judeo-Christian values, but, but once that's completely gone, what then? If the man down the street does not believe that there is a God and his worldview is nothing more than he has time and chance put together, why then should he not live for the day and satisfy his every desire? If truth is relative and what he thinks is just as true as what I think, then how do we know what's right? Church, he needs to know Jesus Christ. And the way that comes is through a movement of God. As you and I pray, God moves and God moves us. You see, with all these things that are going on around us right at the present time, God knows about all of them. And, and God's desire is to take everything that we have involved in our life to him in prayer. To have a heart, to have eyes, to see the things, to seek his will and to bring all of that stuff to the throne of grace. To have him move in our midst and change the world around us through his spirit. James says in his epistle, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Church, do you realize that we have the opportunity to go boldly before the throne of God on behalf of others? We have a spirit of the living God among us that changes the outcome of our eternity. We serve the God of hosts, the God of heavenly armies, we get the privilege of interceding for others and lifting up others to Christ. We can erect a spiritual fortress of God's protection around each other and around our community. Beloved, that's a powerful thing. When we get God involved in our situation, that's what we see here in our passage. They had a reason to pray. They wanted Peter out of prison. They wanted him strengthened. They had a responsibility to pray. They knew their brother was in trouble. and They knew as, as Christian brothers and sisters, they needed to live, lift him up in prayer. And, and what we see out of that, out of that prayer and them lifting up as we finish up today is the results of prayer. Verses 6 through 12. And while the church is gathered there together praying, Peter's in prison. He's chained between Two soldiers, one on the right, the other on the left. There are soldiers that are outside guarding the gates. And all of that is put into the passage to say, this is an impossible situation. But look at Peter. Peter is sound asleep. He has absolute trust in the living God. God is going to intervene as that prayer from the church is being made. Now, several times throughout scripture, we can find where God has brought a deep sleep over an individual. We, we see that with Adam in the very beginning, back in Genesis, with Abram, with Jonah, with Daniel, with Isaiah. A place of deep sleep is where God resolves many things. Beloved, for the believer, this is the kind of peace that we have in Christ Jesus. When troubles come our way, we don't worry. We trust in him. Peter's at complete peace. He's resting in God's sovereignty. He's good no matter what comes his way. I mean, just think about this. God's involved here, and with this rest, we sometimes can't explain it, but we know when the Lord of the universe is at work, nothing can stop that, can it? I mean, God's, God's always in control. Peter knew that Jesus was in control of the situation, regardless if he got out of prison or not. The worst thing that could happen to Peter in this time was for him to be beheaded, just like James. And guess what, church? Then he goes on to be with his Savior. You see, the Bible says that death has no victory over the believer. Death has death actually lost its sting. To die is to gain. For when we're absent from this body, we're present with the Lord and we'll be with the Lord forever. But also, if to live is to gain, as Paul says in that passage, because if we live, then we get to stay and we get to work with in the kingdom and we get to continue to be with our loved ones. And so for Peter... This is a win-win situation. He can't lose here. And for the church, the church, they're gathered together praying that the will of God, no matter what that is, 
is done. And I imagine their prayers probably for continued safety and perhaps release, but I think they're probably okay with either option because later on, as we finish out the passage this next week, we'll find that they believe that Peter was actually executed. And so God hears their prayer. The angel of the Lord appears before Peter. In fact, he's going to have to strike Peter on the side. He says, Peter, you got to get up, buddy. You got to put on your shoes, put on your clothes and follow me. And Peter, he's still half asleep. He manages to get dressed. He manages uh, to move, and just as he moves, the chains fall off his wrist, the cells of the door opens, and he's led halfway down the street before he fully realizes exactly what's happening to him. You see, beloved, when, the, when God's people pray, those prayers are heard in heaven. The Bible tells us that they go up to heaven as a pleasing aroma to the Lord, and though some of them may not be answered in our timing or the way that we would like them to be answered, they're nonetheless answered according to the will of God. Church, we have an enemy that's focused on destroying not only the church, but on every good thing that God has created. And though he will not totally succeed in doing that, he sometimes manages to create havoc. See, there are things in this world that are worth fighting for. And we fight best when we fight on our knees and we pray. I think about Moses in that passage where the Israelites are stuck between the sea and Pharaoh's approaching army. And God's word to them is be still and know that I am the Lord. Sometimes, you know, I walk around town and I talk to people, and everywhere I go, I see folks that are imprisoned. They're imprisoned with fear. They're imprisoned under sin. I see people that are bound by the same things that have kept men and women bound for years. And we not, may not think of that as a bondage, but you can look in the eyes of someone, and you can see that they're scared, that they're fearful that something bad is going to happen. We see that today as this sickness is going around and there's a fear that's paralyzing people. I went with my wife uh, just yesterday uh, to go grocery shopping and the shelves are bare uh, in some places. There's a fear that's paralyzing people. You can walk the streets and you can see individuals who can't cope with what's going on in life even before this and so they self-medicate with drugs and alcohol throughout the day. But we have a whole generation that will literally go nuts without a screen in front of them. These are folks that are held by fear, by sin. And so church, our answer to this is the same answer that we find in our passage. It's to pray. If ever there's a time that we have been called to pray as the people of God, it's now. And so my challenge for you is this with this passage. I, I want to see the same power that the early church saw moving in their community, move in ours as well. And so I'm asking you, as the people of God, to join me together and cry out to God for his mighty hand to be upon us. This church in Jerusalem was praying, and beloved, God did the unexpected. What would happen today if God's people pray? Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we thank you in these crazy times, Father, that we can still get together via social media and other avenues, Father, to come together as God's people and lift up your mighty name. Father, we are thankful that you are sovereign and in control. Father, we know that there's some fears out there with what's going on in our world today. Father, but ultimately... You were in control. And so, Father, we place it in your hands. Father, we ask more importantly that uh, you deal with this fear, and especially with the lostness that's in our community. Father, uh, throughout the next days and weeks and months ahead, we may have an opportunity, Father, to come alongside someone and, and speak into their life. Father, as the church, we ask that you give us wisdom 
that you give us good counsel and the courage and boldness, Father, to speak your name. Father, we pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.